All right, Crystal, what's on your radar? Well, friends, I've got a question for you this morning. What do you think about this house? It's a modest ranch built in 1948 in the Maryland suburbs of D.C. Four bedrooms, two baths, about 1,800 square feet. Needless to say, seen better days, nothing's been updated. Kitchen and bathroom, still the original from the 40s. The realtor's description says in part, this is an estate home in need of some serious love, being sold strictly as is. Please do not go out on the deck. It is not safe. So this dilapidated, modest house was listed for what to me already seemed like a hefty sum of $275,000, but improbably, it sparked an absolute feeding frenzy. 88 offers later, <laughs> 76 of which were all in cash, the house sold for nearly half a million dollars. It went for 460K, that's 70% higher than the original list price. All to be the proud owner of a suburban property that is currently dangerous and unlivable. The winning bidder was not actually the highest offer, but they were totally in cash and they had all the paperwork ready to go. So this type of home in a suburban area, it should reasonably be a kind of a starter home, maybe for a young couple with the energy to fix it up. But what young couple has half a million dollars in cash just laying around? That is insane. Now this particular home might be a bit of an outlier, but there is no denying the fact that the housing market has been blazing hot, especially for the upper middle class. Now, the media has covered part of that story. Affluent professionals during coronavirus, they started prioritizing some different things. They wanted a home office space, more outdoor areas. With remote work, of course, proximity to the office became less critical. At the same time, these affluent workers, they fared really well during the pandemic. They cut back on expenses and availed themselves of pandemic era programs, but they were able to stay in their lucrative jobs, unlike the working class that was, of course, screwed over in basically every imaginable way. But now we are learning that the housing boom and possible bubble is being driven not only or maybe not even primarily by the PMC wanting more gardening space. Permanent capital is buying up homes at astonishing rates. Take a look at this new report from the Wall Street Journal. If you sell a house these days, the buyer might be a pension fund. Wall Street Journal weirdly focused their headline on pension funds because I guess they're associated with workers. But the truth is, it's all sorts of rich people and their financial institutions that are buying up American communities. The report quotes a real estate consultant who estimates that one in five houses in the U.S. is sold to someone who never moves in. That same analyst told the Wall Street Journal, you now have permanent capital competing with a young couple trying to buy a house. That's going to make U.S. housing permanently more expensive. Private equity giants, hedge funds, and other economic royalists are buying up houses, in some cases, entire neighborhoods. And then they're either getting directly into the landlord business or they're flipping them to entities that will rent the suburban American dream to you. As a result, home prices have jumped 16% nationwide in a single year. In the Northeast and the West, the increase has been even wilder, with prices jumping 21% year over year. Does that sound to you like the type of healthy growth that's going to lead to vibrant and sustainable communities? Of course not. It's another disaster in the making. Best case scenario is that the prices just continue to go up indefinitely, which is great if you already own a home and great if you're a wealthy investor, but a disaster if you are anyone trying to buy a home for the first time. And not being able to buy a home is a disaster because it's basically the only remaining path to building any sort of stable wealth in an era of privatization, 401ks, and COBRA. Instead, you'll be doomed to have some private equity goon as your landlord applying their Harvard education and come up with new ways to squeeze every penny they possibly can out of you. They get to build and build and build their wealth, and you never do. Testimonials from the families already living this nightmare are predictably horrible. Distant corporate landlords who do nothing as porches collapse, pipes burst, and mildew grows. Tenants with no recourse and no options who are stuck in hazardous homes. The slumlord of yore replaced with some of America's wealthiest institutions, but with the end result exactly the same. So that's the best case scenario. <laughs> the worst case scenario? It's another dangerous speculative bubble. Sure, market's hot right now, so everyone's buying, buying, buying with all cash offers, gobbling up whatever they possibly can. But at some point, the music stops. The gains reverse even if only by a little bit, and all the big players who bought in big rush for the exits to try to avoid being the ones left holding the bag. They dump their inventory back in the market, dropping prices. Ordinary homeowners who took out giant mortgages to desperately grasp for that American dream 
watch their home prices plummet, leaving them upside down and totally screwed. I'll give you one guess as to whether it will be the big guys or the homeowners who will get bailed out. As one sociologist at the London School of Economics put it, the story of housing in 21st century America. Financialization leads to crisis, which fuels more financialization, which leads to more crisis, which fuels even more financialization. <laughs> Every new crisis is just an opportunity for the economic royalists to come in and gobble up even more of the pie. The people who manage to hold on to their nice homes in good communities become even more zealous about protecting their precarious privileges, lest they or their kids fall into the permanent grind of the renter class. It's the American dream brought to you by BlackRock. And Sagar, this story is pretty shocking. And also, I want to give a lot of credit here to David Dayen yep. and to us, because yes. this is something we've been tracking from the very beginning for over a yeah. year now. Basically, the fallout from the last crisis was that the federal government pushed a lot of these entities to get in the business of buying up right. distressed homes. That turned them into the landlord business. And so every time there's a crisis, even when these financial institutions are the ones that create the crisis, they also stand to be the ones who ultimately benefit. And around and around we go. Yeah, and uh, as you know, I'm personally very struck by this radar because of unexpectedly getting kicked out of my house because my landlord decided they wanted to close to home in. for you. So I'm like in the process of searching, and this story is actually reverberating through Washington circles because. Basically, unless you've got like 900 grand in the bank as a normal person does, you can't buy a house, period. Like they want cash only at 25% above asking price anywhere in the Washington area. So good luck, unless you're literally in the top 0.01%, which means what? Which means that the bank becomes your landlord. And it's funny, I found some neoliberals online who are reacting to this, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, what's the problem? It increases the housing stock. You know, it's not just about housing. You know what the problem is? You don't want BlackRock to be everybody's landlord and just kick you out on your ass anytime they decide? Or what if the market goes south and they have to sell it to some other like Japanese investor group, and then they become your landlord? Landlord. Oh, and by the way, that's the only way that you actually accumulate any intergenerational wealth in America. Yep. But, you know, it's all good because people have, you know, access to housing through rent. That's insane. And again, look, obviously the federal government, you know, and the federal government, and the banks and all these people, 2008, in terms of encouraging people to buy housing, etc., was irresponsible. But in the current moment, there is obviously something to the American dream at the ability to accumulate some sort of wealth period in a normal housing market. We all found Found that out the hard way back in 2008. And if you look at it at this point, how are you supposed to compete? If you have student debt or if you have any sort of payment at, at all, which almost every millennial in this country does, what do you, you, how are you going to get money in the bank? You can't even put a down payment. And at this point, down payments don't even matter because you're competing with BlackRock and JPM, JP Morgan, in order to pay outright cash 20% above asking. Yep. And then even when it crashes, it's not like it's going to be there for you. You think the banks are going to give you because you're based on your credit or whatever, they're going to give you a loan? No, it's the same, it's the same scam over and over and yes, over again. Exactly right. right. Last time around, rather than keeping homeowners in their houses, yeah. They did nothing. They let everyone get foreclosed on, oftentimes through sketchy and fraudulent means, by the way, where they shouldn't even have appropriately been foreclosed on, but they were. And then encouraged that all of these companies to get in the business of being landlords and buying up all this stock. And you can just see it building again. Look, some of this or is organic. Some of, you know, there's a, a class of people who did really well during the pandemic. There's a class of people who are looking for, you know, to move around, to get more space, move further out into the suburbs or the exurbs because they don't have to get into the office every week. Some of it is organic, but there is certainly a portion of it that is just completely speculative. Yeah. I mean, it's just completely gambling. Market's hot. Let's get in. Let's buy up. I kept thinking about, too, we um, covered here this, uh, I don't know if this interview posted yet, the Bill Huang thing. Is that posting on Friday? Oh, it's we on posted Friday. Yeah, it's anyway, on Friday. we talked about this. It's going to post yeah. on Friday. Um, this company that, because they'd gotten so over leveraged yeah. into Viacom oh, yeah. CBS, <laughs> right? right the minute that the stock price went down even a little bit, they were hosed. Mm -hmm. And so even if the housing market, if you are what, exposed in a massive way in the housing market, and sometimes it's hard to tell on a balance sheet because this all gets financialized and very esoteric, and very opaque, then when it starts to drop even a little bit, there's a panic. You got to sell, you got to be able to cover. 
And that can have ripple effects throughout the economy. And that's part of what we've seen over and over and over again is when these big players get involved in a big way, it creates a house of cards kind of a dynamic. So that's a real risk here. And you just know, however this ends up, ordinary people are going to get screwed. Whether the prices keep going up indefinitely or whether you have a bubble that bursts and there's a crash, it's going to be bad for ordinary people. And I think you're right to point to as well, there's a generational dynamic here as too. Because if you were a boomer or potentially Gen X, you were able to get into the housing yeah. market. They got it in the 90s. They're all good. They're selling at 40, 50 they're, percent profit. They're in yeah. great shape. Yeah. Sell the home, maybe downsize, move somewhere for retirement. Great shape. Meanwhile, especially younger millennials and forget about it, Gen Z, it are you know how are they ever going to be able to touch a home? And again, our society could be structured in a way where wealth building was not so tied to your house. But, but that is, is the society we have right now. Yeah, it's just a tragedy. All right, Sagar, looking forward to your radar at that's next.